Hey everyone, welcome back to the 443 Security Simplified. I'm your host, Mark the Liberty, and joining me today is... Corey Jailbird Knockreiner. <laughs> Uh, as you'll find out, Corey's not actually in jail, but we will be discussing a story about someone who may, very well may end up, end up in jail, uh, at least for a little bit. Uh, before we get to that, though, we'll cover a fairly interesting command and control communication channel from some recent research and follow that up with another commoditization of a very sophisticated or I guess somewhat sophisticated uh, method of cyber attack. Uh, with that, though, Let's go ahead and uh, roll on it. So let's start today with a story published by Bleeping Computer uh, last week, uh, detailing a attack chain discovered by a pen tester named Bobby Ronch uh, called GIF Shell. Is it GIF Shell or GIF Shell? Did the, uh, the founder say it was GIF? GIF? The the founder says GIF, but I still call him GIFs personally. The founder needs to learn phonetics. Yeah. GIF is a flavor of peanut butter, so you have to have something else. And it is spelled that way. Didn't he recently pass away? Am I, I think so. I right? think okay, so. so. Rest in peace. But, it, but to be fair, it. he did want to call it GIF for some reason. Should have <laughs> used a J then. Yep. <laughs> uh, so anyways, uh, the article is titled GIF Shell. Attack creates reverse shell using Microsoft Teams. And it claims that it enables attackers to abuse Microsoft Teams for this like, novel phishing attacks and, uh, per the article, covertly executing commands to steal data using GIFs. Uh, so the scenario is it's effectively about sending commands and retrieving results uh, using Base64 encoded GIFs through the Teams platform. And actually did some digging in the article. Comes would you, would you even call it like a back channel? Because it's even the way they're they're putting data in a place that's not even supposed to take that data. And frankly, if you just handled that GIF with normal GIF processing, it wouldn't do crap if I understand correctly. You actually need a, well, we'll talk about it in a second, but something has to specifically handle the GIF in a special way to actually pull out the, the real data. We'll get into the weeds because the reality is like the Teams platform itself, if you are just like if you're using just Teams on a perfectly secure computer, like you're not actually nothing's going to happen to you. Um, it does require, as you hinted at, some additional software. So this actually comes from some research from Bobby Ranch that he published on Medium actually about like a month ago. And it seems like Bleeping Computer picked up on that and then uh, interviewed him and ran a whole big article on it. Um, so there is a key requirement for all this, though, and it's like you mentioned, uh, it requires the victim to install a malicious stager. Um, and, and by the so way, just, a, a stager is just malware. I mean, uh, usually a stager is something that is staging additional downloads of malware. In this case, I think they're calling it a stager, but really it's something that, as we'll find, looks for data in a particular place and parses it in a special way. It's one of those where, so my jumping to the end, my quarrel with this whole bleeping computer articles they kind of like make it seem like people are abusing teams in order to like run malware or malicious commands on people's computer but the reality is people are using teams or theoretically could use teams in as a communication channel for existing malware on the system and we'll get into what that means a bit later but basically like you said it's the stager monitors teams application logs which are stored in a location easily readable by any windows user and basically, after that victim installs the stager, the attacker can then use Teams as a communication channel with the. I keep using stager, but like you said, it's basically just a parser that runs commands. So uh, how it all works in a nutshell is uh, the attacker somehow tricks the victim into installing this malware, let's call it. Uh, and then the attacker then needs to open up a Teams chat with the victim. Uh, so the attacker sets up their own external Teams server, their own little tenant, and then opens a communication with the victim. And this typically works because Microsoft allows external communications by default in Teams. That said, there is a setting in there you can go to disable to stop random people on the internet from opening up a Teams chat with your corporate email or whatever. And um, a good so, thing to do. I think you can also, like, you can still allow guests, but guests by by choice, meaning you'd have to pick what domains or whatever. So yeah, anything, I, anyways, I just think a general tip is it's probably a good thing to change that default. 
Yeah, uh, I'd assume so. And pick and choose what domains you want to guest with you when you need it. Yep. So once they've opened up that Teams chat, they start by just sending you a GIF. Uh, but it's a very specially crafted GIF. So they actually, uh, well, I say specially crafted. Again, this is actually kind of basic. It's literally they take the GIF, which gets encoded into base 64. So basically a text string of uh, letters and some characters. And on the end of that, they tack on a base64 encoded command. And so teams can actually potentially render that GIF fine. Like if you were to pull up that file, it would look like GIF, a GIF file with some garbage data on the end of it. Um, but that but, command- but, to, but to be clear, the teams GIF parser, the, the, the one that what teams uses to parse and show GIFs, animated GIFs or GIFs, and any other teams parser, while it might show the original part of the GIF, it wouldn't do anything with the extra data, right? It's correct. It's yeah. actually so, this is why we'll find what the stager has to do to actually use that extra base sixty four encrypted stuff at the end. So at yeah, at this point, if that malware stager thing was not installed on the host, uh, teams would just show the GIF effectively. Uh, but what does happen is that malware then monitoring the team's log file sees a message with a GIF in it. It extracts that message and then pulls out the base64 encoded command, decodes it, and executes it. So all this is outside of teams at this point. It's just reading logs and grabbing that file, yanking out the command, and then running it. Uh, the stager then it reads the results of that command. So like the proof of concept they used is running who am I? Uh, so returning the, the user logged into the system. It takes the results, encodes those back into base64, and then it uses that as the file name for a GIF hosted on a attacker-controlled server, which it then embeds in a Teams survey card. So the Teams survey card, it's that module in Teams that lets you add polling questions and do a Teams chat. Uh, and then it takes that serving card and then shoots it back to the attacker's uh, te public Teams webhook to basically render that serving card on the attacker's team session then. So long story short, the you send a GIF, this little malware running on it, decodes the command out of it, runs the command, takes the response, re-encodes it, and then uses that as a file name that goes back through Teams to the attacker. So now when the attacker's Teams app goes to render that card, uh, Teams, the application, will make a request to that GIF URL, which again was named using the base64 encoded response. Uh, and all the attacker has to do at that point is just monitor requests coming into their server they control. They can see that Microsoft Teams made a request for this file name, and they know that that file name is the encoded results of the command that they had sent. So they can just decode it and see what the results are. So circling back to the start of this and kind of our nitpick with this one, like the reality is the malicious actions that happen here are with that stager as they call it but that effectively malware installed on the system and they're just using teams as that communication channel which is actually still pretty interesting because the reality is they're now using microsoft's infrastructure for all this command and control communication which makes it pretty difficult to detect and block if you aren't like explicitly looking for it you can't just block teams unless you aren't using teams i guess yeah i agree i find it to be a a novel you know c2 channel as you just pointed out but also potentially a a effective way to i guess actually i guess it wouldn't work for lateral movement i mean once you have that one stager on one computer you actually have someone that you can send teams messages to and gifts to everyone but you would still need the stager on every other uh teams account and computer in order to be able to process them so i guess it really comes down to more a c2 kind of a a c2 back channel yeah and even then like so it's kind of interesting using microsoft's infrastructure then to potentially evade detection but to the victim, like this is still potentially pretty noisy. Like if I was sitting there on Teams and I start seeing a bunch of like random looking GIFs showing up from random emails, I'd be like, what the heck is going on? And probably trigger an investigation. So by the way, still interesting. And I don't think we, I, 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 you're probably going to get into, if, if I remember right, I'm, I'm not sure if you plan on talking about it, but am I correct that Microsoft doesn't consider it a flaw worth fixing? No, I mean, because, well, so there are like some... This is really a, uh, like a collection, a chain of like several weaknesses slash vulnerabilities. And for the most part, a lot of them is like they're expected behavior. 
Like teams will go and make a request for a gift that can be hosted on an external server. Uh, that request will come from their infrastructure as they go to render these cards. There's nothing they can do about that. Like as long as you allow people to communicate with you uh, from outside your organization, you can still receive these messages effectively unsolicited. And I wouldn't like this is one scenario where I don't really think there is a lot for Microsoft to do. Like the reality is it's malware that is just abusing some of these communication tools, like these channels built into the teams in order to uh, mask its C2. So like, I, I guess you could argue maybe they could add some form of like CSRF protection or like authorization to like webhooks that might make it more difficult for parts of this malware stager to fire off its activity. Like maybe they could lock down the, the team's logging directory maybe, but at the same time, like I feel like typically, unless it's like a critical application that for some reason is logging API keys and secrets, like you don't need to restrict access to a log file. Like there's, but at the end of the day, like there's not a lot Microsoft can or necessarily should do. This still boils down to malware just abusing teams. And I don't know. I think it's interesting. I don't think it's as big of a deal as like even I first thought it was when I saw like the headline pop up both in our internal Teams chat, funny enough, uh, but on Twitter as well, too. Uh, I don't think it's as big of a deal as some folks are making it out to be without reading the actual article, but still really interesting. Uh, so anyways, moving on now. Uh, so back in July, I think it was like mid to late July, uh, we covered Microsoft's research into the rise of attacker in the middle phishing attacks. Um, if you have no idea what we're talking about, maybe you missed that episode or you just tune us out after about five minutes of talking, um, <laughs> attacker in the middle, it's basically using a, a reverse proxy to intercept and forward communications between a victim and a target service. So normally if I'm logging into office 365, I go to office 365.com, hit login, put in my info, hit submit. And that connection between my web browser and Microsoft is strictly my web browser to Microsoft. It's encrypted. It's protected through auth authorization so that someone sitting in the middle, as long as they're not on like an NSA supercomputer, has no way of breaking that encryption to view my password and credentials as they're passed between me and Microsoft. Um, I also get the benefit of, you know, the certificate is legitimate and valid. So if I'm check if i mean crap do websites even show or does browsers do browsers even show certificates anymore i guess there is a little gray lock on my browser right now i know they're working to get rid of that but anyways if i were to inspect the certificate it would be valid microsoft.com like everything's perfect and fine with attacker slash adversary in the middle what they're doing instead is they set up a server somewhere on the internet and trick you into visiting that server thinking that you're going to office 365. So maybe they registered the domain name like officia365.org slash India or something and trick you into going there. The web page shows a phishing page that looks just like the Office 365 page. In fact, it's probably the exact page just replayed back to you. And basically your browser, instead of going to Microsoft server, goes to this hop in the middle. And that connection is all encrypted. Like they can set up a valid certificate for that domain specifically. And so you, if you're not paying close attention to the URL, might think you've landed on the legitimate site. And you go and hit the login button, uh, you go enter your username and password, and that fires it off from your web browser to the attacker server, who then takes that and proxies it over to the legitimate Office 365 website. Office 365 responds back with usually like a session cookie uh, at like a super high level. There's a lot of back and forth that goes on until then. but. Ultimately, they'll send back a session cookie and the attacker will typically forward that right back onto you as well, too, and then redirect you to the actual Office 365 website. So to you, it looks like you just logged in. You're on the legitimate site. But what happened is the attacker can then see your username and password as it traverses their proxy. They can also see that session cookie as it comes back and steal that. And then now they can use that to effectively take over your session and do any action that you otherwise could be able to do in your legitimate action. The reason this is really interesting is it's actually a way to get around some multi-factor authentication practices, like because they can even prompt you for like an MFA token. They can trigger Microsoft to send that push message to you. And if you provide that token, they'll relay it back. If you accept the push message, it'll accept and continue and 
boom. Or they don't need to do anything because the session cookie is enough once it's established, at least until it expires, right? I mean, the, the password and username capture is tertiary and nice for them to have. And if they can actually capture MFA tokens, great. But if especially for one-time tokens, I don't even see the point of that because what they really want is that session cookie because next time you MFA, it's going to be a different one-time token anyways. They, they, if they have the session cookie, they don't need any of the other crap, at least as long as the session's open and lasts. Exactly. And so, like, again, Microsoft published some research on this about a month and a half, two months ago or so. Uh, and they mentioned that there was like tens of thousands of organizations or at least people that would have been targeted by this at the time. But it still kind of felt like one of those like kind of high lift requires a skilled cyber criminal to set up all this infrastructure to be able to relay these communications back and forth. But unfortunately, the reality is attackers have now commoditized this as a framework that facilitates this type of this type of attack. And they've called it evil proxy. Uh, which is being advertised all across the dark web and just other underground surface web forums as well, too. Um, Evil Web, some interesting facts about it. it, supports like a bunch of different targets. So Apple, Google, Microsoft, all the major social media platforms and also developer tools. So GitHub, uh, NPM, so the node package library, uh, node package manager library for JavaScript based applications. Uh, the Python package index or PyPy for Python based uh, package indexes. Basically, anything an attacker might want to gain credential access to, to either take over someone's email account, their social media account, or their libraries, if they're a software developer, to then do supply chain attacks against other people. Um, Evil Proxy, it operates in this subscription model, or basically the cyber criminal user with quotation marks. Uh, can choose a, a target to go after. So let's say Google uh, and an activation time period, so like 10 to 30 days. They pay the uh, the malware authors over Telegram uh, and then they get a download link to a specially crafted kit, basically. And the kit has Docker images and setup scripts to basically set up the entirety of the infrastructure. The uh, criminal user then just has to go register a phishing domain uh, that looks convincing for their target and then fired away at would-be victims. And through this infrastructure, then, it takes care of all that man-in-the-middle proxying activity and spits out session to uh, tokens or authentication material for the cyber criminals to then use those victim sessions on those servers. Um, the toolkit's actually, I mean, it's got some protections, too, to go against uh, to identify bots or analysts. Um, so it can look for and match like the victim's IP against like VPN services, proxies, Tor exit nodes. And if it matches one of those, I can redirect them to a completely different site. So the example that uh, was shown in the, the researchers article was redirecting bots and stuff to just brave.com. I can also identify clients by fingerprints and send them in some other direction too. But long story short, this takes a relatively sophisticated type of attack makes it easy for any low skilled attacker to carry out. And like, unfortunately, that is where a lot of cybersecurity and hack hacking practices are going. Like we saw it with ransomware, where now ransomware is entirely commoditized. You can go on and uh, buy access to our evil or whatever their reincarnation's name is. Uh, they'll set up all the malware payloads, the infrastructure, even payments. And all you have to do is trick people with a good phishing email to click the link and install the malware, or in this case, click the link, visit the website, and give up your credentials. Um, now, one thing I did want to point out that I think you were about to hint at, Corey, uh, is that there are some forms of MFA that might at least tip you off uh, that this type of activity is going on. Like if you use push-based MFA that includes information about the authenticating client, the push message won't show you as the victim mark the liberty in seattle washington or whatever it'll show the location of the man in the middle proxy server instead so if you are happening to pay attention to those push messages that come through and suddenly like you know you are actively logging into something but the push message thinks you're coming from a server in russia or something that should tip off alarm bells but that said like i mean i have to admit if i am actively logging into something i 
don't always check to see the exact location and the push message I get. Yeah, this one's very hard. If they time it quickly with the real login, because they are the the proxy would get it real time. So as long as they're fast, they could do it. You know, I I may just assume it was me because my push came seconds after you know I really did log in. Uh, so yeah, it's you should look at that. Don't get us wrong. We're, we're admitting bad OPSEC in some cases. The, the good OPSEC is to look at the location and if you see a difference. And by the way, I have before. Once I was traveling and came from a different country than I was in. And while in the end it was me and there was a reason, I actually stopped the authentication because of that at first. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm with you that it's an easy one to miss if it actually happens real time. I wonder, I feel like this is something that web apps have to do. Uh, like when we're talking, I, I don't think there's a different way than having a session cookie, but one of my concerns is just, it seems like there's no policy on expiration of session cookies. Like I know some frameworks like .NET framework has a session cookie expiring by default in 20 minutes, which I think is pretty good. But I know Facebook, by the way, when you get an app like Facebook, there's a lot of different cookies and they tie to the session cookie differently. But I think if you have that keep me signed in thing, a session cookie could last for 90 freaking days. Uh, you know, so theoretically, if you get one, <laughs> the bad guy could use it for quite a long time. Now, I think the solution for this, and I suspect Facebook and Google's do this, is they got to look beyond session cookie and start to apply some of the Yuba you're talking about in their web application. Like, uh, one, I, I would still, even to help people keep logged in, I would avoid 90 day session cookies. I, I feel like they're doing monitoring now of paying attention to where you log in. And if they see geo differences or time differences, you've probably noticed a lot of sites say, hey, I've seen a new login to Netflix from here. I've seen a new Facebook login from a new browser from here. And they they might even deny that until you respond. So I think the fix might be web applications going there. But in general, it, thinks, it makes me think, are session cookie expirations too long? And is there even an industry standard? Because it seems one site might expire a few seconds like banking sites are good with this i feel like if i don't touch a banking tab for two minutes when i come back i'm logged out but facebook i feel like i'm never logged out to uh to get super in the weeds with it like i, I most or at least many web web applications these days use a combination of like a an id token so that session token and then a refresh token where the id token does expire potentially even like minutes like tens of minutes or so but that refresh token is valid basically indefinitely. So when you come back to your session in your browser, what it does is it uses that refresh token to get a new ID token and a new refresh token and continue the chain. And how that could kind of benefit in the situation is like, so we'll assume that the attacker has control of both the ID and the refresh token courtesy of this proxy. And that's what they're using to act as you. When they go to refresh that session, it will refresh that refresh token too so your copy of it will no longer work if you happen to go after them and that might set off some alarm bells but like you said like this the real protections for this are first off basic phishing protection like making sure that you're checking urls that you aren't going to some random domain that looks like office but then from the service providers uh side like basic uba like making sure that you're monitoring where these connections are coming from maybe triggering a new push notification if you see them hop from one location to another like i know uh at least with off point um our mfa product we can trigger a a push notification if you go from a trusted network to an untrusted one like one where maybe you had no mfa requirement like office vpn to hopping off network next time you try and access the system you have to do the push thing but that does seem to be at least a, a decent mitigation for the style attack the reality is though like authentication attacks are starting to get really sophisticated and now they have to it's a, to, to me it's kind of a good thing i mean the i i want to see mfa bypasses show up in the research community just because it means good the the defenders out there are using it more often so bad guys are finally finding a reason so sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you mid thought but i i think the, the it's neat seeing more focus from the attacker side on mfa only from the regards that 
hey, people, you're using it, and it is it is a barrier to entry for these bad guys. So while we might find things like this, uh, it, that, that doesn't mean don't use MFA. It means think about your MFA implementation. Yeah. And like, unfortunately, now we've got frameworks like this evil proxy that do make it easier for even any old script getting yeah. started up. And that's the big story, right? I think we said in when Microsoft first talked about Avisory in the middle, nothing was new. And at then we didn't really, I think the big story here that you brought up is the fact that, hey, this kind of explains why so many companies were quickly targeted with Microsoft and now others. Once they have a exploit kit like this on the, the underground, it like lowers the bar, as I think we both say all the time. Now, a lot of people that don't necessarily have to understand every detail about how to set up a reverse proxy have a very easy exploit kit. So expect more and more threat actors to leverage this would be my guess. Yeah, I... And it, it kind of explains in hindsight what was happening at Microsoft when they announced during our first podcast on this topic. Yeah, I agree entirely. Um, so moving on now, uh, this one actually kind of, I feel like it has to start with a bit of story time. Uh, to go over a history of something that I remember. Story time. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. I feel like I'm about to watch Mark's TikTok video or something. Story time. I don't do TikTok. Sorry. Um, I assume not. I know how much you love Facebook, so you probably love China's Facebook even more. Barely do Facebook either. Uh, so this one actually starts Again, with <laughs> like sarcasm for how much you love Facebook. Correct. Yes. <laughs> um, trying to remember i don't think we did a podcast episode on this but i know we at least did like an article on simplicity when this happened and i probably at least I, th I feel like you and i have talked about it it was long long ago. wasn't this years ago when it first came out that they they didn't disclose the mandatory so i feel like we might have but it would have been so long ago no wonder we don't remember anyways so uh starting with some story time here this begins back in september of 2014 with a small little tech company called uber uh, where back in September 2014, Uber discovered unauthorized access to an S3 bucket, so a storage bucket in Amazon's cloud, that once investigated, they found dated back to May of 2014. Uh, in that incident, they discovered attackers made off with a PII of around 100,000 drivers uh, by using a AWS access key that they had found available in a public GitHub repository. So basically... Uber developer was working on some code, accidentally left the access key to hook into the storage bucket in their code, pushed it to a public facing repository. Cyber criminals found that, used the key, scraped the bucket, stole all the data. Uh, so in February 2015, several months, almost a year after the fact, Uber actually notified its drivers and the FTC who launched an investigation to figure out what the heck, this is a pretty big breach. Um, two months later, Uber hired Joe Sullivan as CSO. So Joe's actually relatively famous, or at least well-known in the cybersecurity circles. He's the former CSO of Facebook for five years. Yeah, I say he's famous because he came from the DOJ, actually. He used to be a prosecutor uh, before coming over to the, uh, the civilian side to work for big companies like Facebook and such. Um, but about a year after hiring Joe, uh, so in November of 2016, uh, Joe actually received an email from an anonymous threat actor claiming they had exploited a quote unquote major vulnerability to gain access to an Uber database. So this is a separate incident from that 2014 one that at this point in time is still under investigation from the FTC. Uh, so Uber's security team investigated this new report and they found that attackers had stolen uh, GitHub credentials this time to gain access to a private code repository in which they found AWS credentials, which then let them dump the new S3 bucket uh, to the tune of 600,000 drivers and 57 million users. Uh, quite a bit bigger. Uh, this time, at least they had to jump through the hoop of getting GitHub credentials first, but still, I, we'll get back to some of the issues here after story time. Um, so after discussing this with the then CEO of Uber, uh, Travis Kal Kalanick, Kalanick. Uh, Joe... Uh, steered the threat actors towards Uber's Hacker One bug bounty program, where they paid them $100,000 in exchange for signing an NDA. Uh, so the next year, in April 2017, Uber sent a letter to the FTC requesting that they close the investigation for that 2014 breach, and they made no mention of this new 2016 incident, basically tried to sweep it under the rug. 
Uh, later that year, in 2017 still, Uber hired Dara, I'm going to ruin this one, uh, Kosroshi, Kosroshahi, Kosroshahi, yes. Um, I can sound, I can hear the phonetics in your head. Oh my goodness. Uh, you could probably see my brain ticking over in that one. I'm I, so I would sorry be doing the same, the by the way. Uh, speaking as a fellow, not probably to that extent, a victim of name butchering, I'm sorry. Uh, anyways. I'm sorry. So I'll stop saying la liberté. <laughs> In, uh, La liberté. Okay. Let Sorry. me finish story time, Corey. It's interesting. Uh, if you're still following along with this, so later 2017, Uber hires a new CEO. Um, and as part of onboarding that CEO, they asked Joe to brief them on that 2016 data breach. The uh, new CEO subsequently discloses the breach and apologized for not disclosing it earlier. Like, this is where Corey, you and I came in. We're like, oh, well, that's crappy. And later that day, even. Uh, news broke that Joe Sullivan and one of his senior lawyers on his team had been fired for concealing the breach and paying off the hackers during that whole shenanigans. This triggered the FTC to go, whoa, what the heck? Um, we should go into the paying off the hackers when we get into it, because I feel like uh, while some things I would maybe look down upon, they're not legal, but the, the, they're there's another part that is legal. So there, there's some things that people may not love, but maybe wasn't necessarily a bad act that you should go to jail for. Uh, but there's something that I do think clearly someone should be responsible for. But yeah. we'll get into that after story time. So closing up story time, uh, there's a whole period here now where the FTC reopens their investigation into uh, Uber because of this new 2016 one that they clearly slept under the rug. I think all 50 plus Washington, D.C.'s uh, attorneys general uh, open up investigations and there's like this one hundred fifty million dollar settlement that comes of it. Uh, they actually are able to identify uh, the two 20 uh, year olds that had done the attack. Uh, I think they went after what was it? Linda dot com. So part of uh, LinkedIn's learning network. And as part of their trial, they also confessed to the whole Uber thing. Uh, but. At the very end of it, uh, the U.S. Department of Justice actually um, slapped Sullivan uh, with one count of obstruction of justice and one count of misprision, misprison, I've never heard that word before, uh, of a felony, uh, basically from covering up the breach and obstructing the FTC's investigation. Uh, so fast forward to now, uh, Joe Sullivan's trial is actually finally starting, and it's brought up quite a few interesting points but uh first and foremost like the trial judge they actually commented to the prosecutors quote i had not until this moment realized that your case was really against uber and uber is going to be sitting here in the form of mr sullivan and there's also like the infosec community seems pretty heavily split about their feeling about this either he's being scapegoated like, there's no way that the decision to pay off attackers and not notify the FTC could have been made without a uh, discussion and approval from the executive team. But then others are saying he should be held accountable because he clearly was in charge of the security organization and swept this under the rug. And so, Corey, like, let's first talk about what you just brought up, like the not necessarily illegal. But there probably are some illegal parts of this, but still like potentially bad things with paying off attackers. So, like yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about what I think is clearly illegal and someone should probably be held accountable versus not. But before, just so you know, Miss Prisian, if, if others are in our, it actually is, is neglect or wrong performance of an official duty or concealment of treason or a felony is, is what that word means. Fancy lawyer words. Uh, I, did, I, I didn't know either, but worth talking about because we are talking about whether something is negligent or not. Uh, so the first thing is I... I uh, well, there's some folks that are defending uh, Sullivan because he's well known. There's some folks that have been kind of negative on it. And there's two parts that are negative. Some don't like the fact that he they use the bug bounty program as a way to pay off the, I would call them black hat. I mean, maybe they acted gray hat as the way to pay off the hackers and have them sign an NDA. And while like from a personal principle, I love bug bounty programs. Let's start with that. I love white hat researchers that responsible disclose, uh, resp uh, you know, do responsible disclosure. And I also don't even mind gray hats as long as they're not really being malicious. But I will say 
I don't like the idea of using bug bounty as a way to pay off bad guys. I mean, they've already broken the law. They're bad. I do think that necessarily though may not be illegal or put them to jail that may have been a risk decision for them as a company because they knew by at least finding a mechanism to pay these guys they could at least get a promise through the nda of non-disclosure of the information so you might argue that whether or not you principally like by principle like them using their bug bounty to pay off these two what i would call black hats in my opinion uh I could argue that they were trying to protect the data of their customers that was already out there. So to me, the, the payment of the bad guys through the bug bounty, personally something I would not want to do, but I don't know if anyone should be on trial for that. That's a, a decision I may not agree with or like, but is it illegal? I, I don't know. And I could argue that they're trying to, at, you know, once the cat's out of the bag, they're trying to at least put some back in and, and mitigate risk for customers. So that part of it, I don't think should be part of the trial. But whether or not you did that or not, if your customer's data is breached, even in this way, even if you paid, got them to sign an NDA after, that doesn't alleviate the breach or the fact that these are black hats that despite signing the NDA, they're already criminals and they may ignore the NDA. So I feel the big topic here is once you know your customer's data is out there, it's purely law to disclose the breach. So I, what I'm getting at is the only legal part to me that I would be upset at Uber for is not following mandatory data breach disclosure, which is clear US law. That's a law, everyone has to follow it. So that's my feeling on the two points. I don't know if we should get into now who should be responsible for that. And honestly, so using your, your, I agree with everything you just said right there. And then following that train of thought, like it does seem to fall on the shoulders of a CISO type role, like the person that would, that or like someone on the legal team who would be responsible for notifying about a, a potential breach, in which case you could argue that maybe they do have the right guy that they're talking Here's to. where I differ because it doesn't, uh, I, I don't think you go based on responsibility because guess what? The CISO is not the decision maker for the company. Uh, he, it's frankly, I, I could give a recommendation and my company could go as an executive. I sit on a team with other executives and the board. And if you are a legal and transparent CS, CISO, hopefully you're sharing transparently this type of thing. So is a CISO responsible just because he's a CISO? I say no, Mark. I say he's responsible if he was negligent and not transparent. If the CISO and some of his team was, were the only ones that knew this and the rest of the executive team did not know this and the board of the company did not know this because the CISO was hiding it within his power or her power, that would be negligence and that would put the, the criminal liability on an illegal act on them. But do we know if that's the case? I don't know. What if the CSO told the entire executive staff and the board? So and the back CSO to that, recommended in yeah. this specific scenario, there are actually like text messages that were found during discovery, or either text or email, of Joe Sullivan going to the CEO saying, "I need to talk to you about something uh, sensitive." And so it wasn't the content of that conversation, and, and but that does seem that's to... that that's that that's going to be where the meat is. And just to be clear, if if someone didn't do that however he did that yet yeah, like maybe he still didn't share enough so maybe it still falls on his negligence but clearly if the ciso didn't do that and they're trying to just cover up something that's happening to them from their entire company to sweep it under the rug they should be on trial but but if it turns out a CSO actually did follow all the things, and you never know, by the way, the CSO might have recommended, hey, this should trigger mandatory data breach. We need to get law our, our legal team. And they may have been overruled by the ex other executive team. And just because it's, you know, just because you're accountable for security publicly does not mean you run the company or get to make the final decision. Now, the I will say the side effect of this and the thing that doesn't look good, if you were a CISO in this situation and you were trying to be the good guy following the law and your entire board and an executive team ruled against it and, and decided to overtake your decision on, on whatever you would do, 
a proper and smart CSO would resign right there for something legal that would put them in jeopardy. So the fact that they didn't resign and they they might have participated in the cover up with other members of the company could still leave some liability to them. But I to me this I don't think this should worry a CISO as long as a CISO follows the law. Like you, I think if the, I guess we'll find out in the ruling, but if the ruling says that all CSOs are automatically the only one legally accountable of anything, regardless of what really happened, that would, suck. That would be a problem. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I would not want the role anymore. But if, if it turns out that we do hold CISOs accountable who are the ones who break the law and hide it, but we don't hold CISOs accountable when it turns out there were other members that made decisions above them, I, I think that's the right way. And we're going to only, the only way we'll learn the result in this particular case is what comes out in court. I think your text messages you just mentioned are a telling, interesting fact that I'm sure his defense is going to focus on. And maybe other materials will come out where we learn what with, what happened there. Uh, but. I think it's naive to think the CISO gets to make the decision unless the CISO is the one hiding it from everyone in the company. And by the way, I think this is what we did talk about on our podcast. It all depends on if they were the only ones knowing, hiding it from the rest of the team, or was the entire executive team involved in the decisions that were made. Yeah. And so I guess putting a bow on it, though, like like you already said quite a bit there, like as a CISO or in your case CSO and uh, or a cybersecurity professional, like what can you do to protect yourselves from the situation? I think you like you hit it on the good one. Be transparent and legal about your operations and then have morals and resign if you're stuck in a illegal situation. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think you as a security person, you need to have trust, honesty and 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 personal principles to kind of do this job passionately. But I, I think there's room to make tough decisions too. Like I said, I may not have agreed with the paying off the black hats uh, at all, but that's not a legal decision. And if an executive team decided to make that decision, that could arguably protect. So that doesn't mean you always have to do perfect things, but legal is the key word there. You, we, it, this is a regulated thing. There are legal requirements to business and cybersecurity. And as a CSO, you're, one of your biggest responsibilities is not just maintaining the security of your business, but actually following the law when you have to. So I think when it comes down to the law, that's where it gets black and white. And then when the law is broken, people have to figure out who all took part in that. And uh, what I'm getting at is Sol Sullivan may be just as culpable. He may have some liability here because they didn't resign. He, it, you know, it, it happened that they did not disclose until quite a bit later. But it for him to be the only one, uh, it all depends on a lot of other details. And I don't think, you know, in the same way, a CFO shouldn't be legally responsible for tax evasions that one of his accountants made that he didn't know about. You know, yes, maybe some accountant that was leaking or stealing money, but if the business lost a ton of money, uh, yes, you could argue the CFO is someone that at the head should have been the first to find something that was wrong in his team. He shouldn't be legally, you know, criminally negligent for something that someone else did. Unless they actively I don't think. participated in it, which is basically what exactly. this boils, boils down to. Yeah. Did they participate? I mean, was Joe the key participant and was he acting alone for the company or were other people Which involved? just like even outside of this situation, acting alone as the CISO just sounds like a recipe for disaster. Like our whole job is being open and communicating with, like you said, executive teams or just other stakeholders in the company about like what's going just on. Just to learn about, I mean, to protect anything in any department, there's a ton of we need from them to learn of what's there to protect. So I absolutely agree with you. It's it's kind of hard to properly do our job if you're trying to be a secretive organization. And it's a, you shouldn't be in this business if you're trying to avoid law. And while no one wants to announce a breach, you know, as a company that has seen threat actors do things, we know it's not pleasant. But I actually think the security, I, I think the benefit of doing it properly outweighs the breach itself. I think 
uh, as long as you're not, <laughs> as long as you have no security and you you clearly are negligent in how the breach happened, I think most of the industry and community realizes that any company, Microsoft, the biggest companies in the world have had multiple breaches. And it gets forgiven if it's handled properly and taken care of it. People understand we live in a war. Uh, in a, you know, it's this passive cyber war, but we're always up against threat adversaries, whether you know it or not. And there are going to be battles that get lost. And it's all about making sure you're at least fighting for the right side that are doing the right thing. So I think if you're a CISO, if you, if you try to do the right thing, yeah, yes, breaches will happen, but I don't, if, if a CSO goes to jail just because there's a breach on his watch or her watch, that makes no sense at all. You know, it, it should be more how they handle it. Did they follow the law? Uh, did they do everything in their power before to try to fix, you know, prevent it? And what can they do in the future to lessen it? And then from just a technical standpoint, if you are a software engineer, don't save secrets in your source code even if it's a private repository that's just a recipe for yeah. disaster but i mean this trial is still going to be interesting to watch uh, i feel like for it is sure. going to set a precedent whatever that precedent may be and so as a cybersecurity professional now in a like a somewhat of a leadership position and you as cso watch guard this is something that's i, I would be on test. trial if this was something we did for sure yeah that's actually a good idea huh uh oh, <laughs> there goes Marcus trying to plot his fate. <laughs> Don't worry, you'll get it. Some I would never. Anyways, let's wrap it up before I admit to anything that may end up with me on trial. <laughs> oh wait, all the podcasts we've already recorded. <laughs> okay, crap. <laughs> hey everyone, thanks again for listening. As always, if you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. If you have any questions on today's topics or suggestions for future episode topics, you can reach out to us on Twitter. I'm at XORRO underscore. Corey is at SecAdept. And the both of us are at hashtag the 443 podcast. Thanks again for listening, and you will hear from us next week.